inside in Myanmar. Welcome, Jenny. And uh, followed by uh, followed by Pierre François de Kier, uh, who is the head of the Media Freedom Program at Article 19, uh, who will tell us uh, more about uh, his organization's pioneering work on social media councils as an innovative method to moderate uh, content online. Um, we are also joined by uh, Professor Abila Schneier, a senior lecturer at uh, Aston Law School, uh, who is also a member of Evidence Workgroup for the UK Council for Internet Safety, as well as a member of the UN IGF Dynamic Coalition on Child Safety. And last but not least, obviously, we are joined by Mr. Ben Skertes, a policy officer at Unit F2 on digital services and platform at the EG Connect for the European Commission, who has been working extensively on uh, the recent regulations called the Digital Services Act and the Digital Market Act. So welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. So these discussions, as we said, will cover the uh, role that social media platforms play in both amplifying and moderating expression online. Yesterday, the 25th of January, was the 10th anniversary of the Day of the Revolt in Egypt. As a decade earlier, uh, as millions of Egyptian citizens protested in the streets um, and showed up in Cairo Tahrir Square, social media platforms were praised for fostering revolutionary movement and were seen as a service to enable of, demo of the democratic right to dissent. However, from the Rohingya genocide in Myanmar to the recent US Capitol riot that was fueled by Trump's tweets, society has also witnessed social media being used as an amplifier of hate speech and disinformation. As a result, both governments and platforms have decided to play an active role in regulating the digital environment. Yet these unilateral actions have been criticized for centralizing the oppressive power of censorship in the hands of a few people. Today's panel will discuss uh, in depth the risks and challenges of online content moderation and how we can envision a new way to regulate the digital realm. To start our conversation, I would like to ask a direct question to Ms. Domino. Since you have worked extensively on Facebook's scroll in incitement of the Rohingya genocide, could you tell us more about the Myanmar case as well as how social media platforms should be kept responsible in moderating their own content and whether they should be liable for it, um, in particular, keeping in mind the recent deplatformization of uh, Trump, I think it would be interesting to start this type of conversation. Thank you, Sonia. First of all, I'd like to thank the Institute for inviting me to be part of this distinguished panel. I'd like to qualify that I'm speaking here in my personal capacity and whatever I say here do not, do, does not reflect the views of my organization and my colleagues. Um, I'm asked here to reflect on the great so-called great deplatforming and its implications for freedom of expression. And just like you, I'm familiar with the complexity and novelty presented, not really novelty, but complexity presented by the issue. And instead of giving clear cut answers, I'd like to use this opportunity instead to offer some provocations to help shape the conversations occurring in this space. So first of all, I'd like to emphasize the need to decenter the US experience when discussing global regulation of speech. You might already have heard from so many that uh, this is not the first time that the, that deplatforming has occurred. Um, it just so happened that it's the first high profile ban that has occurred in the US. When news broke of the deplatforming, there were um, various news reports saying that this deplatforming is unprecedented but I think that only applies if you're talking about the US context, but it's definitely not the first with respect to social media platforms generally. And in fact, Myanmar may be one of the first countries to have its first ever high profile ban in September 2018. As you may know, in that month, that was the time that the UN fact-finding mission on Myanmar released a report saying that in a country where Facebook is equivalent to the internet, hate speech circulated online and was shared by military leaders, civilian government leaders, and religious figures. And coinciding with the release of that report, Facebook deplatformed several Myanmar military figures, including the commander in chief of the Myanmar army. So you may wonder at this point, what is the value of decentering? what's happening in the US in relation to uh, global regulation of speech. Well, centering the US experience 
in conversations and platform power may tend to obscure or may obscure how other societies and contexts deal with problems relating to social media. And I think that's very important to highlight at initially. Second, given my very limited time to speak on these issues, I'd like to emphasize the corporate responsibility of these platforms to respect human rights under international human rights law. Now, what would that entail? When it, with respect to dominant social media platforms, they must adhere to the standards set out in Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which provides safeguards in limiting freedom of expression. And those safeguards are the principles of legality, necessity, and proportionality. And I don't want to get into the details of all this, but I'd like to emphasize proportionality. The UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression um, emphasized that in contrast to states, platforms have a range of tools within their disposal in moderating content. So deplatforming is an extreme version of it. And given the timeline that happened in the States, given the timeline that happened in Myanmar, given platforms relative inaction with respect to these two countries in, in preventing the spread and virality of hate speech, deplatforming may have been called for under a human rights framework. Um, but even before that happens, platforms have a responsibility to make sure that their technology is not used by various actors, including state leaders, in spreading incitement to discrimination, hostility, and violence. So they have a range of tools at their disposal. They, have, they can introduce friction so that it's harder to make certain content viral. They can um, uh, Im impose other uh, tools that we can uh, look at later. And the UN Special Rapporteur actually enumerates some of these tools in his report. Um, and I would like to highlight here as well that public figures should generally enjoy less protection under a human rights framing because of their influence and the likely reach of the content that they post. And the third one, I think this is, rel this is very relevant to the Facebook referral of the Trump ban to the oversight board. So just to give a brief, uh, a brief background, Twitter and Facebook handled the Trump the de deplatforming slightly differently. So Twitter uh, deplatformed Trump in order to prevent further risk of incitement to violence on the platform. This was two days after uh, the riots took place in the US Capitol. Um, Facebook took a slightly different approach. It also deplatformed Trump, but the account suspension was indefinitely, um, was for an indefinite period until at least the inauguration. And after the inauguration, it decided to refer the case to the oversight board for its decision. So I think the million dollar question now is, can the Trump case serve as precedent elsewhere? Meaning places like the Philippines, where you also have an authoritarian leader that is famous for churning out really um, state, uh, statements, problematic statements from a human rights perspective. And in my view, it depends. It depends. Um, that doesn't mean that I am against deplatforming. Platforms can deplatform for many reasons. But what I'm trying to address here is simply whether the Trump case, as it happened in the US, can be replicated and transplanted to analyze situations occurring around the world. And with respect to that question, my answer is it depends. And I think here are some factors to consider. I list here three factors. First is use, social media use. In US and Myanmar, state leaders who were deplatformed were very active social media users. So in Myanmar, the commander in chief was an active Facebook user in uh, with respect to Trump, he's an active Facebook user. And I presume this is one significant factor that guided platforms decision making. When the public itself, when user individual uses, individual users themselves know that behind the account is the actual state leader, right? The influence is definitely magnified versus an official page where you know it's handled by the comms team. Now, I'm not saying I have the answers to this, but I think the over, this is something that the oversight board uh, should consider very carefully because it, it gets interesting. 
In the Philippines, for example, Duterte is not an active social media user. Most of the statement, problematic statements that he said were said in traditional offline settings. He doesn't have, he has an official account as mayor. He, he was previously a local government official before he became president. He, that account is still on Facebook, but it's not, it's seldom used. It's seldom used. And much research exists how Duterte's political messaging was in fact propped up by social media influencers and political minions rather than by Duterte himself. I'm talking about online, okay? I'm not disputing the fact that offline he's been saying all these statements. So here is where it gets uh, complicated in terms of the line drawing exercise that the o oversight board must do. So Duterte's statements easily pass muster as grounds for limiting speech. There's no problem there, and I'm not disputing that. But is it a condition that the state leader use the platform directly and actively? Or is it enough that he has a page? Or is it enough that the page airs, posts his insightful statements, for example? And I think here you need, this is where it, it's connected to the second factor, which is the immediacy of the acts of violence and the likelihood of harm. And, and I think it's also important here to connect the proportionality, the range of tools that I mentioned a while ago at the disposal of platforms. So it, when it comes to immediacy of acts of violence, this is actually something um, that international criminal courts in speech trials have also grappled with, the problem of causation. But the, the, it, the same set of problems arise here, but not to the extent we don't need to fixate on it to the extent that international criminal tribunals do. Why? Because deprivation of liberty is not on the line here. Deplatforming or introducing friction is not equivalent to sentencing somebody to jail, right? Which is what criminal courts do. So now there's still that question, right? How far should these social media platforms go in terms of tracing the immediacy of acts of violence? I don't have the exact answer, but I imagine that answer would be a bit far from how international criminal tribunals make that calculation, precisely because the stakes are a bit different. Um, and then, and again, again, it also comes back to the timeliness of the action. So these deplatforming moves are very extreme and are last resort moves. If before that platforms are more, have a more systematic approach, and I, and I concede that that systematic approach is very hard to do at scale, but if they do that, then maybe um, we won't even have to reach um, these kinds of decisions, such as deplatforming. The last thing I want to highlight as a factor is the work of public institutions. So in the COVID-19 context, platforms have become more aggressive in moderating verifiably false information from state leaders. So we've seen posts that were moderated from posts from the Brazilian president, the Venezuelan president, President Trump, were moderated based on assessments made by public health authorities, such as the WHO. In Myanmar, when the Myanmar military officials were deplatformed, Facebook also referred to the FFM report. Um, it did not actually mention the community standards supposedly or presumably violated um, by, the, by those military figures. Instead, it referred to the FFM report in its announcement. So it's important to, and I'm sure platforms are, are already doing this internally, that they are looking at assessments of public international institutions. Um, the problem here also is when certain countries are not covered by, you know, certain situations or cer certain issues are not covered by these international institutions. So maybe the work of NGOs, the work of academics uh, become relevant. Now the twist here is also that Myanmar military officials were deplatformed, but not everybody were. In fact, just last year, I wrote in a blog piece on Just Security that uh, the military spokesperson is, has set up an account and it's still here. It's still up and running. Civilian leaders that were identified by the FFM 
as also spreading hate speech, they still have their Facebook accounts. So this, again, complicates the line drawing exercise, right? And again, I don't have the answers, but it might help to think of these issues in these terms. And so lastly, uh, this is the very last point, I want to emphasize also the state's duty to protect human rights. So we, I feel like people from the global south are always dealing with two things, how to constrain private power and how to, how to seek accountability from rights violating regimes. So even as we hold platforms accountable, we should also seek accountability from states to meet their human rights obligations. We should be wary of both forms of power. That's all. I'd end there. Thank you so much. It was actually extremely interesting. And um, unless the other panelists have uh, something else that they would like to add, um, I have uh, actually a direct question to your last point on the role of uh, public institutions and in general of governments that they play online. Um, as you said, over the past year, especially with the COVID situation, uh, we have seen more and more public institutions and government playing an active role um, online and especially on online content moderation, whether it was like to spread their agenda or spread safety, um, uh, safety information for people. I would like to ask a direct question about this to um, Mr. Dokir, uh, especially as he works for Article 19, that is in, uh, an organization for freedom of, of expression. I would like to ask you um, if, in your opinion, uh, the gov governments and public institutions should actually play uh, an active role on uh, uh, online moderation uh, of content. Um, and uh, if so, what should be their position in this kind of like digital and decentralized space that is the cyberspace? I think we're having a little bit of a technical problem. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Okay, sorry about, about that. Um, but it's not a good Zoom call if you don't have a technical glitch at some point. So at least I covered that for us. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Sonia, for the, the invitation and, and for the, the question. Um, what I would like to, to start with is a very short introduction of Article 19 in our philosophy, at least one point of it, because that will be not, I'm not doing advertising for my employer, I'm just trying to find a way to get to your question actually. And I will also along the way say a few words about this um, project that we've been working on the Social Media Council and how it relates to um, the topics that you would like to discuss uh, here. Um, so Article 19, we are a London-based human rights group um, with a strong focus on, on freedom of expression and, and the right to information. Um, but while we are based in, in London, we also have regional offices um, that cover work in their respective region. And that is, um, they are very independent. They're not uh, regional offices that are controlled by international headquarters. They're autonomous entities. And that's a way to ensure that our action is based on a robust and well-informed understanding of the national and the local context. Um, and actually one of the key principles of, of Article 19's work is, is to try and build a two-way flow of communication between the international level and the local scene. Um, it, it means, for instance, that, um, well, some, some of our activities may seek to bring human rights to the local level, for instance, when uh, trying to advocate for changes uh, in the legislation on, on media in one country, for instance. And in the other way, we also want to help local voices be heard at the regional or the international level. Um, for instance, in, in relation to the development of international norms or international initiatives. Um, one, one of the things that Article 19 is known for is the development of, of sets of legal principles on freedom of expression in relation to a number of issues. For example, we have one on defamation. And whenever we are elaborating those sets of principles, we always do extensive consultation with uh, people from one, hopefully everywhere. We really are trying to integrate a broad diversity of perspectives from various regions and various, various countries. And that, that is 
an element of our philosophy of our way of working that was very important in the elaboration of this project, the Social Media Council. Um, it, it is one of the ways, the Social Media Council is one of the ways through which we approach the impact of social media platforms on freedom of expression and, and on the agenda of public debates and uh, the impact also of, of uh, content moderation on individuals' freedom of, of expression. Um, what it is, uh, in a few words, um, the Social Media Council is a model for a voluntary compliance mechanism that will oversee content moderation issues on uh, social media on the basis of international standards on uh, human rights. Um, so all of these different aspects could, could trigger our long conversation and I won't engage in too much discussion, but um, one, one thing um, of, of interest maybe is to mention that in our um, view that the Social Media Council, the SMC, uh, will have two roles, two manners of, of working. The first one will be to provide individual users with a remedy, sort of an appeal, um, whenever their content has been taken down on, on a social media platform, or whenever content that they would have liked to see removed as, as uh, can still be found on, on, on one platform. Um, the second role will be to elaborate general guidelines for social media uh, platforms. And in both of these missions, the SMC will rely on international standards. So that's, that's the body of rules that will inform its decisions and its work generally. Uh, it's also very important for us that it is a participatory mechanism, which means that it will be created and it will be operated by all relevant stakeholders. And that would include um, social media platforms, that would include human rights group, uh, but also other civil society organizations in order to have on board like a broad representation of the diversity of society. Um, academics, academics, sorry, uh, media and journalists, and, and possibly the advertising industry should also be uh, on, on board of this initiative. And, and the goal is also to make sure that the Social Media Council will operate in a transparent and in, uh, independent uh, manner. Um, so we, we first um, launched the, uh, the idea, um, and, and then we started discussing it with academics with representatives from uh, the various big platforms and with other civil society organizations. Um, the um, then uh, UN Special Rapporteur David Kay picked uh, up the idea and endorsed it explicitly in one of his reports, which gave it uh, a lot of visibility. Um, and, and we also did a, a conference with um, the Global Digital Policy Incubator at Stanford to further discuss the idea. We had a long online consultation and, and we've done panels and discussions at various international and, and regional events. Um, and, and there were, to, to, be, to be fair, there were other comparable ideas that have been put forward by other uh, academics or, or, or CSOs. Uh, and I think that today, uh, often under the name of Social Media Council, that sort of, of idea is being debated, is being discussed in reports, in, in academic publications, and then as options for legislators to, to consider. Um, so, so in addition to having this thing as an idea, um, Article 19 is also trying to turn it into a, a reality. So we're, we're trying to launch a, a pilot version of the Social Media Council in, in Ireland at, at the moment. And that would be a first um, real thing, and, and that might be the basis for its um, exploration in other, in other contexts. Um, maybe it's, it's, I think it's fair to say that the area, the, the domain of um, oversight of platforms, of social media platforms, is, is it's a very dynamic debate today, but it's also sort of a, um, a sandpit area. It's an area for exploration and experimentation and um, so far, uh, well, as I said, we're trying to turn the SMC into a reality, but so far the only thing that exists is this oversight board of, of Facebook, um, which, which is uh, something global. Of course, their composition uh, to some degree really tries to, to have it open to, to a certain degree of diversity, a certain capacity to speak a number of languages. And certainly those, those 20 people have impressive profiles and impressive capacity to speak various languages. But it's at the end of the day, it's 20 people we're expected to be able to understand the subtleties of a content dispute in any region of the world or any language. 
Um, other thing that is interesting to note is that in principle on paper, the oversight board will operate on the basis of Facebook community standards and of Facebook values. But we can also see that they're trying, some of them are trying to pull the conversation in the direction of international human rights standards, which is an interesting move. Um, so at, at this stage, that's, that's um, something that we need to observe. We, we'll see how that, how that evolves. Um, so that's, that's for the SMC, the Social Media Council, and, and, and um, by comparison with, with the, on the existing oversight uh, uh, organism at, at the moment, um, I would say that we think that the SMC should exist at the national level, um, unless, unless, and that's, that's very important, unless there are concerns for safety of participants in this, in this initiative, which can be the case in, in many countries very sadly. Um, another risk that could exist um, would be the risk of capture by state uh, actors or by other powerful local actors. So where those two risks can, can be avoided, I think really we should aim for having some form of oversight organization at, at the local level. Um, because um, that would ensure that the people making decisions on the oversight of content moderation dispute are actually people who speak the language, who understand the complexity of the local context, the culture, the history, the politics. And, and that, that, is, that is, I think, very important in terms of um, giving voice to, um, to, to, the, to, to local voices, really. Uh, that, that, that is an important aspect of the, of the work we are, we are trying to do. Um, and it, it's often the case in the conversations that me or my colleagues can have with journalists, with civil society organizations from various countries, especially in the global south, that um, the people that we speak to will tell us that they've got no opportunity to reach out to platforms. They've got no capacity of being heard by, by Facebook or, or, or by, by Twitter or, or any of, of them. Um, so really looking at a way of organizing um, something like a social media council or, or in a lighter version, it could be like a coalition of, of local actors on content moderation issues. That, that may be a way to, to give more weight to a critical mass of, of local voices and, and um, raise their capacity to be heard by, by those uh, world uh, scale platforms. The other um, important aspect of, of the project that I wanted to, to discuss uh, mention here is the fact that we suggest that the social media council should work on the basis of international standards on, mm -hmm. on human rights. Um, and it's a bit of a weird idea to um, a private uh, multi-stakeholder organization apply uh, international, international standards to make decisions that would not be legally binding it's a bit unusual, but I think it still makes sense because um, the uh, international standards, they provide a, a set of rules that are, well, universally valid. Uh, they've been interpreted by international, regional, and local courts, institutions, and authorities, and experts. And so we have like a broad body of, of interpretation that, that can be mobilized uh, there. Um, and I, the, the, whether or not a local application by, by something like the SMC would question the principle universality of human rights. I, I don't think it's something else than the, the classic tension that we have about human rights in general. Um, a standard, a rule, and that can even be said about a constitutional standard. It can only be applied in a given context. And that does not mean that the rule itself or the standard itself is less universal. Um, and, and of course, on the basis of context, we can have like a reasonable or a moder moderate degree of, of local variation. Uh, for instance, it, it's a well-known thing that the scope of the right of privacy in public spaces, just to take one instance, can vary a little bit from one country to the neighboring country. Uh, and it still is the right to privacy and it's, it's, it still is the very recognizable right to, to privacy. Um, so, so um, the, 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 um, 
local application, the application of, of, of human rights on the basis of context is very compatible with their universality. Um, and I, I think it's also important to note that in looking at the application of international human rights to platforms, context would mean taking into consideration the specific features of each product, of each platform, which means that um, the application of international standards to a message that's been disseminated on Facebook might be different than YouTube or Twitter uh, or any other. Uh, and which means that there is, there would be a little bit of variation. And it means also that when we're saying that human rights should be the body of rules of reference, it does not mean that we're inviting Facebook and the others to just copy paste international treaties into the, their terms of service. We're just saying that the broad general umbrella set of rules should be international standards and that they're fit for purpose. Um, in a sense, they're fit for purpose, but they're also, um, that would be something new, right? Applying international standards to content moderation. Mm -hmm. And we have on the basis of existing um, uh, uh, academic publications, ex existing case law, et cetera. We've got lots of references, um, but still there are questions that are new and that would need to be explored. Uh, and I think that's, that's a challenge for uh, maybe a network of young researchers, for instance, or, or generally uh, CSOs and, and academics in, in the world to, um, to, to try and um, explore further this, this question of how to um, apply international standards to, to content moderation. Um, I think I will pose here, uh, and if there are any follow-up questions, I, I'm very happy to try and contribute. Um, thank you so much. It was actually really interesting to hear more about the social media councils and how it would really translate um, in, in, in a real concrete way. Um, there is one point that I think is very interesting and it kind of connects with another question that I would like to ask to uh, Professor Nair. Um, the aspect of uh, social media council would being really um, a local reality that really helps to kind of connect the social media platforms with their, uh, with their users on a local level, I think it's really interesting. And uh, as some of you may know, over the past um, month or so, there have been like uh, more and more of an active role of social media platform in uh, moderating their content. And this has often had different type of results. On one end, we have something very uh, visible, something as similar as to the Trump uh, uh, ban, uh, the ban of uh, Trump's account on uh, Twitter, Facebook. But at the same time, um, just prior to that, uh, I think in December, there has been an, um, an Instagram policy update. It has also, um, that has been also accused of like marginalizing communities and really uh, reducing the, uh, the influence of certain uh, group of, groups of people. So I would like to ask to Professor Nari, in your opinion, what are the pros and cons of this new active moderation by social media platforms? And in particular, are, what are the new parameters that are emerging from such instances? And are, they, are these parameters kind of being used as a guidance for future cases? Thank you, Sonia. Um, that's really fascinating talks earlier before me, Pierre and uh, uh, Jenny, and they've touched upon some of the things I had meant to say about uh, social media regulation. But I want to take a step back and could you started the, the, the panel by referring to the internet as decentralized and, um, and I actually wonder how decentralized things are as we speak. Um, the earlier conversations, if you go back to the 1990s, when people talked about the internet as um, unprecedented medium of uh, communication, freedom of speech and everything else, um, a lot of analogies were drawn to public squares. So, you know, unlike the traditional medium, you don't need to be somebody to be heard on the internet. A speaker and a listener can be interchangeable at the same time. There are no barriers to speech. You can, anybody can be a speak, speaker or a listener in the, in the medium. So that's how it used to be um, in the 1990s. But is that really the case anymore? I think that's the question we all need to ask ourselves. When platforms or social media, powerful social media companies in particular, filter speech in a way that, you know, you, the target speech to their audience in a manner that people see or hear what they want to see or hear, 
rather than providing access to the full spectrum of speech. And that's, that's what free speech is all about, really. Free speech is not just about the right to speak. It's also about the right to access information from the full spectrum rather than somebody else deciding what you can hear or see. And that's what some of these recommender systems do. And you're going back to Trump's example, that yes, they did eventually deplatform Trump from Twitter, but that didn't happen until about two weeks before he was due to step down anyway. So they did com you know, commercially benefit from um, Trump being on Twitter for a very long time. And um, I'm not entirely sure if it was just the moral conscience that eventually led to the decision, but that's not the point. So the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, when you talk about freedom of speech, and that's one of the largest things we were talking about here in this, um, on this panel, it's not just about letting people have a forum to express their views. It's also about being able to access information from the full spectrum, you know, rather than somebody, uh, powerful platforms using algorith algorithms to tailor speech to so that they can target certain audience with content they want to hear or see uh, in, in a, and, 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 and manipulating their thinking in the process. So, um, so that's one issue. The second issue I want to talk about related to that is the status of these platforms. If, now, my colleagues talked about, Pierre in particular talked about international human rights framework applying to platforms. Jenny also talked about human rights um, it, as it applies to social media companies and, and platforms. Now, yes, how are they regulated? We've had a, they've had an easy ride over the years in terms of self-regulation. Now, if you ask Twitter, they would probably say that, well, we were only enforcing our own community standards, community guidelines, so or terms and conditions. But is that is that enough, really? I mean, are they just neutral, content neutral platforms? And that's another question we need to ask. I don't think they are content neutral platforms. If they use recommender systems to create filter bubbles, to target their audience with content that they think this particular set of group of people want to hear, that is not. Uh, entirely content being entirely con content neutral. They're actually exercising some form of um, editorial um, role in, in the process. And the laws as we have it now, and I'm sure a colleague from DG Connect will talk about the Digital Services Act and everything else. But as we speak, the rules that apply to these platforms predate most of these powerful social media companies anyway, you know, the, the e-commerce be it the e-commerce directive in, in the EU or the uh, Communications Decency Act, Section 230 in the US, they all predate these bigger social media companies by a good few years. So they couldn't have envisaged at the time that the power and influence these companies wield. Now going back to that human rights question, yes, the European Convention on Human Rights, we all know that human rights, um, right to free speech, right to privacy, but what it does is it also provides people a remedy, a recourse, if there is a breach of those rights by a public authority. But sadly, that only applies to public authorities and not uh, private bodies. And one of the reasons, so we can convince uh, these companies to incorporate within their terms and conditions to recognize international human rights principles, but whether they comply with it or not, or enforce it or not, is an entirely different matter. And I think perhaps there is room for debate to start thinking about whether some of these uh, platforms, the larger powerful platforms, are they merely acting as private bodies or regardless of their status, are they actually discharging the functions of a public authority? And in other words, can you require them to enforce the human rights obligations that uh, these international human rights instruments um, set and, and guarantee uh, individuals? And that's the second question um, I think I wanted to pose to the, the other panelists and also the broader audience. Did you have another question for me? So I was just reserving my time for. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I actually have a very specific question for you uh, that still concerns the um, social media, uh, big platforms online. And later I would like to connect to, um, uh, to the questions to Mr. Kens, uh, Kertes. Um, so my question is that as you're an expert on uh, child safety online, I think that there has been a really big uh, scandal that happened uh, over December regarding the platform Pornhub. 
uh, the scandal uh, was started with an article by the New York Times that uh, reported that there were actually um, lots and lots of um, child pornography videos on the platform. And the platform reacted to it only after Visa and MasterCard decided to terminate their contract with, uh, with them. So I would like to ask you, in this very specific case, which is obviously like maybe less related to freedom of expression, but really on other type of rights online, I would like to ask you what is really the role of governments and the platform and like who should be held liable in this case? Um, and especially like how, since it's a platform that allows users to post their own content, who should really be held liable for this type of like really harmful content? Thank you, that's, that's a very uh, good question. As far as illegal content goes, clearly illegal content like child sexual abuse material, the law is very clear that you know, there is a notice and take down regime. So once they have actual knowledge, a constructive notice of uh, the existence of an illegal image on their platform, then there is a legal obligation per e-commerce directive to take it down as expeditiously as possible. So I'm less worried about um, the, 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 the legal framework, the current legal framework as, apply, as it applies to illegal content. But the problem area is really in relation to content that does not really squarely fit in within uh, the definition of illegal content, but yet could be harmful for many sorts of reasons. So a particular one to note is non-consensual distribution of private images. So for example, one of the other issues that a lot of people complained was a lot of the content hosted by Pornhub featured images or videos that were captured as, as a result of human trafficking or even revenge porn. Mm -hmm. So where the, the image wasn't produced in the first place for public distribution, as not as pornography. And they were uh, just frustratingly slow to address uh, complaints of such images uh, on their platform. So that's one issue. The second issue is in relation to access of those images, unfettered access that these big porn hub and the mind gate companies, the larger porn providers provide to the broader audience, including children. So. To give a little example, a child cannot go into uh, a shop, a sex shop, and buy porn. You know, uh, it, that the society would frown upon that, and and that is not based on any credible, uh, conclusive evidence of harm, or psychological harm that porn can cause. To that's a different matter. But the fact of the matter is, in the offline world, that is not possible. Whereas, all it takes in the online space is to just tick a box saying that you're an adult and. You know, that, I don't think that is that can that, that is a sustainable way to do it, especially given the the variety and the nature of content hosted by the larger platforms like that. So I don't think the the onus is now up to them to mm -hmm. um, to change their ways. I think it's about time we have some form of regulation that requires them to age verify their customers in a manner that it does not pose impediments or right to individual privacy. So I, I'm not for restricting the right of adults for accessing adult content. I think adults must continue to have the right to access content that are suitable for them. But at the same time, you know, content needs to be restricted. So what I call it content access focus regulation rather than mm -hmm. content focus regulation. I don't think we can any longer talk about anybody or state, including governments can talk about certain content is good or certain content is bad. I'm talking of adult content rather than child sexual abuse imagery, which it remains illegal. So I think there needs to be access focused regulation with age verification, but also they need to act more responsibly. These, these platforms need to demonstrate more responsible behavior in terms of ensuring that the content that people upload are from verified users, rather than letting anybody upload anything without any checks. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, that some sort of consent mechanisms exist, complaints mechanisms exist, and they act on those complaints. They make a lot of money, you know, but they don't invest enough in content moderation or in personnel in order to take down content when things go wrong. And I don't think that is permissible at all, really. Thank you so much for your reply. And uh, I have, uh, connecting to this, uh, I have a really big question for uh, Mr. Kertes. Um, as the European Union is yeah. about to launch the one of the biggest package of regulations on um, big, big platforms online, whether they act as gatekeepers or uh, editors of online content moderation, I would like to ask you, first of all, like, what are the values and principles at the core of this regulation? 
and also in what way they try to redistribute the power over online content moderation in general. I know it's a big question, but uh, I'm really I'm really curious to hear your point of view on on this. Thank you, Sonia, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first of all, it's uh, for me as well a big uh, privilege to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I think it's really important that uh, even as the proposals of the Commission uh, are starting to be negotiated, uh, it's a privilege to engage with, uh, with NGOs, the academia, all kinds of uh, experts of the field. Uh, sometimes, uh, and I, I can tell this by experience, stakeholder engagement uh, can be skewed by intense lobbying. And I'm, um, uh, we are very conscious that this, uh, these, these proposals will be, um, uh, will be very similar. Uh, I personally come from um, this to, 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 to this unit uh, on digital services and platforms from the copyright unit, and uh, used to work on the um, on the copyright reform just a few years ago. Um, where freedom of uh, expression was obviously at the center of discussion. So again, uh, um, much appreciated and very, very interesting discussion so far. And, and thanks for all the other speakers. Um, uh, the other introduction I wanted to make is that um, uh, it's also very interesting uh, to um, talk about these issues from a more global perspective. Uh, we, of course, when we negotiate these proposals, we are uh, very much um, focusing on our internal issues uh, of the European Union, uh, one of them being a very important issue and actually uh, one, of the one of the key principles of the proposals, it being the internal market. In the, in the European Union, um, um, the, 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 well, we are trying to uh, create an internal, internal market also for digital services. And uh, this is, these, these uh, proposals um, uh, pursue that uh, objective. But of course, we are in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a world where these issues are, are global. And um, I, of course, the, the, um, the, the recent events in the US uh, are, uh, are a great example. But I, 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 I very much agree that this goes beyond the US, which made the news everywhere. Uh, and it, we had seen precedents uh, all around the world before. That said, uh, just a last word on the US. It is, it, it, is, um, it is extremely important, though, to have to see that the United States um, is slowly engaging in this discussion as well. Because, of course, the main platforms we are all talking and thinking about are US-based. So we uh, at the European Union, we are really looking forward to a constructive um, cooperation also with the new administration. Um, even though we have a very different approaches and one of them, and I saw a, a question in the, um, in the chat about liability. Uh, well, there is a, a, an important difference between liability approaches. And let me now talk a moment about our proposals and uh, starting maybe from, from liability. What you asked, Sonia, about our, our, our guiding principles and, and values. Um, we, uh, so two, two issues. We advertise these proposals, which were adopted in December, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, as uh, something like a new framework for uh, digital services based on European values. And um, what we mean by that, I think, first and foremost, is uh, a respect for fundamental rights, those enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Uh, if you look at the draft uh, proposals, you see plenty of reverence to these rights, in particular, freedom of expression and, and, the, um, and information. Uh, of course, it's part of it, but also freedom to conduct a business. And, um, and here, uh, I think the key takeaway is, uh, and I'll come back to that, is that the uh, proposals are trying to achieve a very, uh, difficult uh, and careful balance between different interests because we um, while uh, protecting uh, users and freedom of expression is very important we also want to ensure that there is an innovation and there is um, um, and, and also digital ser services continue to thrive uh, now another uh, angle i can approach this uh, is um, as regards our core values is that of course, there's a lot of preparation that goes into these um, uh, into these proposals. I mean, you all know, I'm, uh, the experts will know that this is not uh, this is a continuation actually of European Union efforts 
uh, in these areas, starting from uh, uh, rec uh, com rec communication, recommendation on illegal content, um, and and uh, but I can talk, talk uh, mention sector specific um, initiatives from terrorist content online to the copyright directive to the, uh, to the ongoing child sexual abuse material uh, negotiations. Uh, what we did is we did an ex a very very extensive um, uh, open public consultation where we received and analyzed over 3,000 contributions, uh, many of them coming from individuals and and the uh, and experts uh, academia. Again, that was a, an extremely useful. Uh, basis and what we also did was an evaluation of uh, of the um, the famous e-commerce directive um, uh, we heard mentioned before uh, adopted 20 years ago and we found that there were three key principles of that directive that are still valid today and uh, that therefore remain uh, at the core of the proposals these being um, uh, the the the, the so-called conditional limited liability exemption for um, for intermediaries and I hear I let me highlight here because we discuss so we, our proposals focus on intermediaries not editors of content I I, I I take the point it's very interesting discussion thinking about if an intermediary applies content rec recommending system when does it become a, 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 an editor but that said legally speaking our proposals focus on intermediaries. Um, uh, uh, then um, uh, we have um, uh, we have uh, uh, the important principle of the uh, prohibition of mo general monitoring obligations. Uh, this uh, this uh, this is um, uh, an important uh, principle which limits uh, the uh, limits the the obligations, but also the instruments whereby um, um, intermediaries. Um, but also member states can act uh, against illegal content um, uh, in order to protect the privacy and the freedom of expression of, uh, of citizens. Um, on this note, I wanted to mention that um, uh, the um, what uh, what the DS we have okay we have two proposals and um, I think so far mainly we have been talking about uh, issues that fall under the scope of the Digital Services Act. But there is another proposal, let me just mention it very briefly, which is called the Digital Markets Act. Um, it's also, uh, it is um, also about um, a similar scope about uh, digital services, but uh, some services which are really specific, which are, can be identified as so-called gatekeepers, and therefore have a very, um, a, a very important role in the, in the, in, on the market. And what we try to achieve there is uh, fairness and and um, and contestability of markets. Uh, but I, I think we better focus on the Digital Services Act. Um, and, uh, and and I, I just wanted to mention just a few because I'm aware of time. Um, again, key key points uh, to to be aware of. First, the Digital Services Act is a horizontal instrument, is intended to be a horizontal instrument, complementing any sector-specific um, 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 uh, law from, uh, from terrorist content or to copyright. And uh, it therefore provides a, a horizontal general framework. It doesn't deal with what is illegal or harmful. Uh, it, it, instead, it, it, it does provide a, a more procedural framework and uh, and a lot of guarantees uh, to um, to to set the, the set the framework for for these uh, online services how to uh, deal with um, with mainly in illegal content. Uh, we have a special focus on a subset of, uh, of of online intermediaries, online platforms platforms, and even within that. Uh, a category we call very large online platforms. Uh, these are I, these are defined as uh, as platforms having over 45 million users per average monthly users uh, in the European Union, and they will have really extensive obligations uh, uh, to to pursue this, uh, the, these um, uh, our objectives. And to try to try to sum up and see it then if there are any follow up questions. Uh, again, um, I want to point out some of the key uh, principles and values. Uh, one of I think the, the main ones are increased responsibility of digital services, increased transparency 
of how they um, how they operate and moderate content, increase accountability, uh, and uh, this uh, and and this all this under a democratic oversight, one which is effective and which is coordinated at European level, actually can be taken can to be can take place at at European level. Um, and uh, finally, um, um, a very important uh, element of, of our proposals, uh, a lot of thought went into this, is to how to make all these provisions proportionate. Uh, and uh, one of the elements I mentioned already, uh, we have created this subset, subcategories, and uh, because uh, we think that uh, very large online platforms represent a higher risk uh, of harm to society, and it it makes sense that they are expected to do more. But imposing those obligations on smaller services, which do not represent the same level of risk, would be disproportionate. To give you an example, but to give you another example, uh, uh, it's clear from the proposal that when there is illegal content in the system, uh, we, uh, we 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 expect the actor. Uh, that is in a way in the best position to act against it to, to to take the first step and this is to make sure that it's not you know just to give the extreme example it's not the internet service provider that cuts off the service or the platform or, or, or the platform that deplatforms uh completely someone there has to be a gradual a proportionate uh, uh, approach um uh, and um and, and 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 the same proportionality principle uh, is reflected also in the enforcement powers of, uh, of national and European um, uh, authorities, whether they are uh, applying any sanctions or, or penalties. Um, I think I'll stop here because, uh, because it's time. Uh, thank you so much for your reply. I think that really uh, explained really well how, what are the core values of the uh, new the new EU regulations and I think that it really shows what are the issues and the, also the difficulty that we have in striking a certain type of balance. Um, before uh, just answering to one of the questions from our Q&A, um, I would like to thank you um, um, Pierre-François Dukir who had to unfortunately leave us because he has another panel discussion right, starting right now. Um, if that's okay for you, uh, for the other panelists, uh, we will just go over one quick uh, questions and uh, obviously to whoever would like to answer it, to it first, uh, please um, uh, do so. So the question says, uh, I would like to have an opinion uh, of the panel on one of the problematic issues that I see in platform content moderation and its self-enforcement, whether they are responsible and liable uh, for what users post online. If they are not, then moderation and enforcement of human rights restriction uh, seem, seems less justified to me. Um, this is something that we have obviously already covered a bit. And I was wondering if any of you has something to add to this, you know, to this question of liability and if you would like to answer to this. Um, if I may, if I may try. Yes, please. Yeah, so I think that the right, um, a better way to frame this is, are platforms responsible for the way they do their business, right? And if part of that doing business is moderating content, um, amplifying particular content on the platform, then in my view that it that triggers um, hum respect for human rights as, as articulated in the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else would like to uh, add something? Well, I'm I'm very happy to add very briefly a, a much more um, le legal legalistic approach. Uh, I, I which I but I have to um, uh, reiterate is that liability of online intermediaries in the European Union is regulated currently by the Commerce Directive and which and those um, uh, and the Digital Services Act proposal, what it does is almost copy paste those uh, existing liability uh, provisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, those, uh, the, the reason for this is this I mentioned at the beginning uh, in, my, in my introduction that this was one of the principles which we found that was actually working. And we have also 20 years of case law 
uh, of the Court of Justice of the European Union that builds on those principles. And uh, uh, that case law we find is very valuable. And there is uh, a way, so the, the, the um, and, and there is a, a complex legal um, structure, uh, how and when, actually it's not a legal, the, the, the legal structure is not about when an intermediary like a platform is liable for content is rather when they cannot be held liable for the content because they are exempted because the starting point um, uh, maybe not so um, extensive as in the united states but also in the european union 20 years ago was that in order for these services to operate to grow and function they need a certain liability exemption a shield of liability but that doesn't that, that is conditional that is based on conditions and can be removed and what one of the things that dsa will do is it will harmonize the so-called notice and action procedure which will give legal certainty uh, to all players about when this liability when this until when this liability exemption applies when it is removed and what will the platform need to do in that case so this is um, uh, this is yeah this is one of the things we are certainly addressing. Thank you very much. Um, as we are really running out of time, and I don't want to take advantage of your uh, really incredible like for accepting the, to to participate to this panel and for your time. Um, there is just one final question to all the panelists. Obviously, obviously, um, I would like to wrap up this thought provoking conversation. Uh, by really asking you if there are any concluding, concluding thoughts that you would like to share and uh, to our platform or any initiative that you would like to um, sponsor to our platform. Can go. If, yes. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I was waiting for. <laughs> well, I, I think I think one of the things we haven't talked about today is not to lose sight of the fact that one in three of all internet users are children. Okay. So the uh, earlier the you know legislation, the international uh, regulatory instruments we were talking about were conceived in, at a time when children did not form so much as part of an part of the internet, but that has changed. That proportion is even higher in certain jurisdictions, certain countries where there is a bigger digital divide between parents who do not are, are not as digitally savvy as as in developed um, countries. So I think it, it, in the wider debate and the wider scheme of things, we should not forget that the internet should be designed in a manner that should function in a manner that it is a safe space for children, uh, but also at the same time that children are not excluded from. Um, it, reaping the benefits of, of the internet in terms of their access to information and everything else that, that they need. Um, I think that's my concluding thoughts. I think that's a very important one. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else? I, I just, I, I'm, I'm happy to go. I just want to thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you for the excellent thoughts and questions. And uh, just a final uh, thought. Um, we we are convinced that what we are doing now uh, on these proposals at the European Union is urgent, is needed, and we are really confident that we will succeed. But obviously, this is not going to solve all our problems. And um, what um, what is very important is that there are other initiatives, whether they are about you know co-regulation or just sector-specific uh, initiatives. They are very important. They will complement these proposals. Um, so uh, we we are we know that we can cannot solve everything with this, but this is really needed. This framework is needed urgently to build on it. So um, we look forward to more discussion um, with, with you and, and, uh, and, uh, and the civil society. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. I'd like to leave the word to Jenny, who also had, wanted to add something. Uh, really, it's just to thank the Institute once again and to all our um, viewers today and also to my co-panelists, thank you. And I'd like to emphasize also that there must be a diversity of voices bearing on this issue. Uh, most of the experts are based in the global north and um, it's good to have, as my panelists, my co-panelists have emphasized a global conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. It was really an incredible pleasure to have you all and 
definitely we cover such a complex topic with so much depth. Um, just for our um, for our um, listeners and uh, to our audience, uh, this conversation uh, will be available both on the website of the institute and uh, on our Facebook page, as it was a, um, a Facebook Live. Thank you so much to all of you. It was such an incredible uh, panel discussion, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.